That looks okay. And it's still recording, which is always a good sign. Yeah. I will unmute you, so you okay. are now live. And I'll get you. Great. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, we'll move on to our second presentation from today, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Robert Casey. Now, Robert Casey comes to us from America. Uh, he's been an active genealogist for 40 years, publishing nine 600-page family histories at his website. Ten years ago, he started concentrating on genetic genealogy and created the L21 Y-SNP predictor tool in 2011. He has extensive websites on a variety of different surname projects, including Casey, Brooks, and Kiersey. The, he also runs the L226, or has an L226 private haplogroup project, and an L21 private haplogroup project. Now, due to the explosion of y -SNP testing, he continues to concentrate on determining the relationship between STR signatures and SNP testing results, and is now developing new methodologies to produce genetic descendant charts based on both YSDR and Y-SNP testing. Um, the impact of the explosion of y -SNPs being discovered is covered in depth in Robert's presentation. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Robert Casey. Well, this is a uh, distant cousin of mine who fought in the Confederacy. He was a lieutenant, uh, Joseph Henry Brooks. He survived the war. Uh, this is a kind of overview. The first section I'm going to talk about one of the nice things for project administrators, uh, certainly project administrators, is you got to sort out all these groups of SDRs. It's really difficult to do without SNPs. And so with SNPs, you can quickly separate all the groups to people who are or are not related closely. The second one is uh, well, SDRs are very noisy. They're like, uh, they're like water flowing down the river. You go out to the edge of the river and you're unique, that's great, but you can flow back and forth and then end up in the middle of the river again where you were 5,000 years ago. That doesn't happen too often, but it's uh, 5 to 10 percent of the people have a problem in that area, and that's why you get a false hit rate with just normal genetic distance matching. SNPs will actually help you filter out those false hits. Also, uh, you need to understand what signatures are. Signatures are better than genetic distance. Genetic distance is what you don't, you know, how much different you are. Uh, signatures are what do you share with other people. And what you share is really a much better methodology to determine relatedness. And also, once you develop a pattern between SDR marker values and, and particular SNPs, you can actually sort your spreadsheets and predict very accurately, I mean we're talking about over 99% on the vast majority of SNPs that are in a certain time range. So you don't have to do the R1B or the L21, you can just go directly, look at your signature and test down to the L26 or M22 directly and save a couple hundred dollars. Um, also, uh, if you look at YSNPs, YSDRs, surnames, all those combined together make a really good combination. You really need to have as much information as you can. If you just do SDRs, that's like depending on census records only. You know, as SNPs can be probate records or tax records or whatever. So the more information you have, the more ways you look at it, the more likely you'll be able to figure out what's going on. And, uh, and something that's very exciting right now is there's now getting to be a critical mass of actual genetic uh, information that you can create pretty good charts now of how everybody in your group are actually related. It's not quite there yet, but it's getting very close. And also it's very tedious to create these charts, but there are people that can do it, and I'm trying to figure out ways to automate it. And then I discussed a little bit about, uh, you know, it's a really bright future. The full genomes, which is the, the biggest test, is about 35% more uh, coverage. They're getting one step per three generations. 
when they do tests. So that means if everybody were to test, that means every third generation, just based on SNPs, would you know you could put a marker on your on your great grandfather. Oops, did we lose the signal here? Hmm. Oh, that's why. There we go. And uh, we're also getting with all these uh, NGS tests and Big Y, uh, we're getting a lot of SDRs, and we're not really looking at them yet. We got hundreds of submissions that are that way, and so eventually. You know, if you use 500 SDRs versus 67, obviously that's a lot more content. Now we need to sort out which ones are unreliable and which ones are mutating way too fast. But uh, between these two combinations of lots of uh, big Y tests in the future and lots of SDRs, we'll be able to assign actual certain mutations for everybody on our pedigree chart. And there may be a few unlucky ones that don't have one or skip a generation, but it's they're going to average two or three mutations per ancestor eventually. Now that's 10 years out, but that's going to happen someday. Uh, most projects do organize their groups. I'm talking about surname projects. And what they do, it's really hard to sort them out if you're a surname project administrator, you know, looking at all the SDR patterns and saying which ones are in common. It's a very tedious type uh, job. Uh, you, you'll have a lot of smaller groups like E, I, and J, which are uh, pretty common in Europe, but they're, you know, Europe is dominating our own B. You probably heard that 80 times the last few days. And also many projects have very big clusters along with a lot of really small clusters. And then they have all people who, just, who haven't tested enough. R in 269 is pretty close to R1B, and that's like, 90% or 85% 80, of all Irish people are fall in that category. And this is like four or 5,000 years old. So, you know, having a common ancestor of four or 5,000 years is not recent enough. There's no need to be tested down to more in the 1,000 to the 1,500 year range. Also, a lot of people get isolated. And so uh, you'll know once you get people separated in groups, you know you don't have to look at the surname for all those other groupings because your small group and the three or four are the only ones that are really related. All the other 150 are not going to be related to you. So that's a, a very good thing, a process of elimination of people who are not related to you. Uh, here is my Casey project. Uh, E and uh, E, everybody says Africa, but uh, they've tested some ancient remains in Europe recently and found E in Europe after the Ice Age. And so they're really part of the original Europeans. All these R1Bs, including all us Irish people, uh, were just uh, invaders from the Bronze Age who took over Europe. Uh, e is actual one of the few surviving uh, original Europeans after the Ice Age. Uh, I, of course, I means Viking, uh, and uh, J, uh, there's a lot of controversy about J guy here. J uh, is, if you look at all the academics that said that, you know, in Syria and that kind of stuff, the Middle East, but they may have come with the R1Bs as a minority. They could have come in with the farming uh, uh, inflection of that technology, and so they're probably you know, or a tag along with one of the other incursions. Uh, DF-27 is, uh, is really kind of is an anomaly here because that one kind of has sources in Spain and France. So, you know, we got an Irish person who, you know, has sources and actually in Europe pretty recently. Here's the first big cluster uh, under Casey, and this is probably most of the cases, I'd say, uh, from the clan basis, uh, Casey had two large clans, according to clan legend, and they're both from uh, you know, the Munster area. And so, uh, you know, we have two big clusters. Uh, but this one is a lot more genetically diverse and a lot older. So this is probably the largest clan cluster, so it, it matches up with the uh, clan uh, uh, history books. Here's the second one. 
This is a much larger cluster, but I really think this is a much smaller cluster. This one, actually, there were Protestants in 1750 in South, Western South Carolina, and Western South Carolina was very sparse back then. Now, they may have uh, converted to Protestant because there may have been just one or two men there, and there weren't any Catholic church. There probably weren't too many churches at all. So they probably, you know, one or two churches to pick from, and they were probably Protestant. Uh, this is mine, by the way, and also I've been researching this for 40 years, and this is the reason I got into genetic genealogy, because we're trying to break up the, uh, this cluster. We have around uh, 50 to 75 known men that we cannot connect in the 1700s, and, you know, and there's just all the documentation, the probate records were really poor in this county, so we couldn't make any uh, progress. Uh, then you have the other, uh, the biggest Irish cluster up to two, which is the O'Neills, and you know, there, there's a couple of cases in there, and if you look at the clan lore, it says that there was a Casey group in that area, so this, and it wasn't a very large one either, so this could be them. And then you got, uh, this group uh, is Actually, all these people actually share uh, several markers together, so I had them uh, grouped together just based on YSDR markers at first. And then people started testing. None of these people have tested very much, but some of the people they match has tested L21, you know, very close matches, so I kind of grouped them into the L21 group. And L21 is a big chunk of R1B, so, you know, three quarters of this room. And, well, actually, our L21 is probably only 50% of, of our own, some of that range. Uh, and then this one was genetically different from this one, so I separated it. And you got DF21, that's another major branch around 2,500 years ago. Uh, Z251 uh, is another major branch. Uh, then you have to do something with the new cases. This guy, he knows he's a Murphy. That was his grandfather, and uh, he has proved that you know, he was adopted, or his dad was adopted, but he's a Casey, so you got to include him. He's actually a Murphy. You should go in the Murphy database more, but he's, he's a Casey now, so uh, you have to respect that when people with fairly recent adoptions come in. You want to have all the genetic new lines of Casey's. Because, you know, 500 years now, that's going to, could be a, a major KC line. Right now, it's limited to, I think, to like seven people. So, And then this is a grouping. This is a grouping that really bothers me the most. Uh, they haven't step tested. They're just all over the map. I don't know where to put them. I mean, I, this is just a grouping. It, these are not related because it's way over 4,000 years ago. So, But I, I have nowhere else to put them. Uh, the second topic is when there are they false met, uh, matches. And so convergence is a pretty common scenario. It, it only happens about 5 or 10% of the time. So you say, well, well who cares? You know, it's, you know, that's a very little small amount. But if it happens to you, you can, you can have false hits, 20 to 90%. So you have to be aware that this can happen. And if somebody says you have convergence, you need to be really careful about YSDR matches because they, you know, they may be a lot more questionable in nature. Uh, what causes this is uh, you, you can look at R1B. There's a bunch of charts out there that says here's all the common values of R1B. Okay, and you know, 5,000 years later, what are yours? You have a genetic distance of two from something 5,000 years old. You're in trouble because that means you probably uh, mutated back and forth all over the place, but you ended up about where you started 5,000 years ago. And that's what causes convergence. Uh, so you can have very common SDR marker values, but they can be false hits. And you need to, you know, uh, so if somebody says it's not a max, you know, trust them. If, if, they're, you know, if they have enough skills and you trust them, you know, it's not a perfect system, so uh, you have to uh, depend on a lot of leadership. There's a lot of really good volunteers out there that have been doing this for quite a few years. Then, then here's a new one that I just have discovered. Since we have all these nice new information today, 
and we're getting to be able to look at charts. I started, you know, I started to look at sorting um, just the signature within L226, and I'm finding I, I, I had uh, actually a 90% error rate on the first person who is on the left. That's, these were matches of one, two, and three genetic distance. Now, this is even a smaller portion. It's only for about 50 people out of 500, which is, you know, still, it still is a, a major thing. I'll go that in quite a bit more detail. And so the only thing that you're going to be able to do in that time frame or in that scenario is you're going to have to test snaps to break them all apart because your YSTRs are just not going to be dependable for that particular grouping of people. Now this is a big busy chart and I don't, I'm going to blow it up, but we're going to pay attention to this column, the genetic distance column, and the next to last column, which is the most recent SNP, or the what family tree day calls terminal step, which people don't like that term anymore for some reason. And I've blown this up. Now this particular guy I pulled up is one person, and this is all his matches. And this is what he sees, but this is very condensed down. So he tested SRY 2627. And his first match is this R Y. He said, "Well, that's a match, right? That's good, but that that SNP is 2,000 years old. So there, they are a match at 2,000. That's just a little too far back for surnames and, and good genetic uh, geological connections. You know, for uh, Irish people and Scottish people, that's around 1,000 years for when the surnames actually start being used." And then down here at six, which family tree calls a uh, um, a match. Now this is just my Casey group. You can, it's probably much worse than other groups. You have BY 26, 28. He's part of L21, but that's uh, that's four and a half thousand years ago. So this guy can't be related more than four and a half thousand years ago. He has a genetic distance of six. And not to go in more detail, but there's more examples. But these are all false hits, and this is the only good hit. So he, he has an 80% false hit rate. But if you look at this, a little common sense, it's like, well, four, it, it's still good, but at six, they're all bad. So it's, it's you know, you could, if you do a little you know, filtering of some of the higher ones, uh, then, then you can get back to pretty good matches. Here's the new thing. I, I just took this, the, the fingerprint of L226, which is 9Y. So this, this column here means all these people match all nine signatures. So they're a very clean match with L226. And then this is the genetic distance from the actual 226 actual haplotype. And so, uh, so I picked the very first one random. I said, I'm just going to take the first one and everything that's in light green. Uh, their actual matches. So we have one, two, three matches. Everything in the light burgundy, they're not non-matches. That's a 90% error rate of SDR matches. Now there again, you know, this only happens you know, four or five percent of the time. But it happens with your guy. <laughs> and it happens to all these people here. And they're saying, well, you know, I've got matches at two and three. You know, what's going on here? I'm at a different branch of a thousand years. This is, this is kind of a new phenomenon, and it's, uh, it's something to contend with, because this is not a perfect system. So genetic distance is a good way to determine. I mean, 90% of the time, it's very accurate. So it's a, it's a good way to determine your lateness. But if, and also, you should look at the diversity of your, uh, the surnames for your matches. If you have a whole bunch of matches, and you have 25 matches, and there's 25 different surnames, that looks like you're not really having very good matches because, you know, MPEs are not going to happen at that high of a ratio. But if you only have 80% uh, one surname on all your match, then, then you've got a pretty good thing going there because now you have a genetics confirming that everybody with this genetic pattern are actually coming coming back with the same surname. 
And uh, not all SDR mutations are equal. There's some little ways that you can kind of tease out relatedness. Uh, for instance, like some are very slow mutating markers. I mean, some mutate every 50 generations and some mutate every 500 generations. So if a SDR marker you know, mutates only once every 500, you know, that would be much better because it doesn't happen as often. And so there's going to be fewer redundant uh, copy uh, mutations of that. Also, if you go to a very rare marker value, I'm real lucky in my group. I, I went from 460, uh, 11 to 12, and 12 to 13. Uh, I think under, uh, under L226, that's unique. There's nobody else in the group that has that value. And under L21, there's only like 16 out of 12,000. So that's a pretty unique marker all by itself. And also multi-step mutations. Those are the ones who the value has changed more than once. Uh, sometimes they can do it all at once. But those are another really good, powerful combination because they don't happen that often. Multi-step mutations happen maybe 5% of the time at most. So uh, if you have one of those, they're, they're a lot more unique in nature. And so uh, the most powerful way to... Uh, to figure out if you're related is sharing common mutations of a signature. And so you say, what is a signature? Okay, now this is a busy spreadsheet here. This is a big old uh, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, ignore everything to the left here, and can you see any pattern of color? Well, yeah, doesn't the yellow just jump out and scream at you? Well, this is what you, that's what a signature is. The uh, top uh, at the very top, there are, I put the L21 modal and the L743 modal. This is for L743, which is a, it's, it's a branch, that, I'm not sure if it's in, uh, no, it's, it's an English branch. But um, it just jumps out at you. Once you find out what the fingerprint and then sort the spreadsheet, you can just visually see it jumping out at you. Now, there's one really interesting one here. I'm going to zoom in again because this is obviously way too uh, much information. If I zoom in, and I've now deleted about uh, three quarters of the columns and about 90% of the rows. And it, you see there's one that kind of just jumps at you. There's one that's green and red and white. What's going on there? Well, that one's, this, this step turns out is pretty young. And... Uh, and what is actually happened is the value of 16 at this one particular marker value, everybody who has 16 is testing positive for this particular branch. And, you know, even and then I found the guy down here, he's in row 107, and he tested positive, yet all these guys that are a lot closer matches, but they don't have uh, 16 for a value. So it looks like uh, the value of 16 of this marker and this branch of the step branch are almost uh, one to one, but it could one could be a little earlier than the other. They're, they don't have to be exact. They just are tracking that way. So you might find a couple 16 that are negative or a couple of 17s that are positive. But today it's you know all tracking. But you know, signatures is really good, but signatures need to be filtered by what? Genetic distance. So you just, I just said, well, genetic distance is no good, but it is a good filter. Because here under, uh, this is for all of our, uh, the whole entire R1, uh, not R1, all of our haplogroup, which is uh, probably, uh, well, it, it's 50,000 people in this, in this database, <laughs> and 67 markers. And he matches at, um, he's got an 8 out of 9 match, which is real strong, but he's got a genetic distance of 30. So obviously he is not related. So you can't just depend on signatures. You also have to look at genetic distance to filter out um, uh, really uh, bizarre matches. Anyway, and R1A is really old. Uh, it's probably 6,000 years old or something like that. Yet... They just, they have an eight of nine match on the signature, <laughs> so it can't happen. So uh, how do you do signatures? Uh, what it is, a signature, you take the modal 
which is a mathematical term for the most common value. Uh, and then you take some huge uh, SNP database, in my case for L226, that's L21. So you look at the most common values in L21, and you say, well, that's where I started, you know, four and a half thousand years ago. And you say, well, who cares about four and a half thousand? You care, because it helps develop a signature. So now we're down to the 1500 year range, and it's really older than 1500 years, but so few people, people survive that 1000 year bottleneck. Uh, L226, you can, we, we have nine very unique markers or mutations, uh, and so I find the modal of L226, and there's nine markers that stand out as being different. And so those nine markers that are different between this average, most common value, that's what a signature is. And so then you can take the signature, and you can go uh, find good matches and build hapo trees and descendant charts like all the genealogists want to do. Uh, then you can do it next. Once you get an older haplo, uh, group like L226, you say, well, 1,500 years, you know, that's way too old. Well, then you can take that signature and compare it to your surname cluster. For instance, my South Carolina cluster. And I'm, I'm really lucky because my guys wrote the dice and got 12s on mutations when they mutated all. My wife says that she knew that, but, uh, but uh, they really had a lot of mutations. The next biggest cluster had like three. Mine has seven. And so uh, I can real easily predict anybody in my South Carolina Casey group by looking at that signature under L2, L226 real quick. So finding close genetic matches, such as the family tree DNA matching center, is great, uh, but really shared SDR mutations are better matches. And if you find both, the, the, the how close you are, how much you share, uh, what kind of um, uh, mutations they are, are they you know, really rare marker days, you can, there's a lot of hidden genetic information that you can use to analyze. And then also, uh, the more information you have, it's just like, you know, you can't stop a census record and, and family histories. You know, you, once you dig into the tax records, you get more information, and that's what this kind of stuff is talking about. There's a lot of tax records in that area. Here's another signature, but this is the one that I was talking about for my Casey. Now, I'll zoom in later on this one, but the blue, you know, it, it stops pretty quick. It's like it falls off the edge. Uh, so that's because a surname cluster just isn't going to be as big and pervasive as a big branch of a very large group of people in Minster. Uh, so I'll zoom in here. Uh, and uh, so these are all Casey's. Now, this handy person, uh, he wrote a 900-page book on the handies, uh, and then he came and started doing DNA testing, and guess what, you know, at, in, the, in the 1700s, they all matched, and all of a sudden, in the 1830s, he's matching all these stupid cases. <laughs> What's going on? Well, he, he called me up, and uh, it turns out, well, I was always wondering why I received prob probate precedes from some cases. Well, now I think we know that this Casey died, and he, and he, you know, this Handy, you know, was a nice person and, and adopted some young Casey males. Uh, he is really petrified. This is, you know, the one that uh, you pull up a can of worms. He uh, printed out this beautiful book for like twenty thousand dollars. I mean, it was a beautiful book. And now, you know, like half the book isn't really part of the Handy line. They're really Casey, so he's. We keep them a low profile. <laughs> uh, now, another thing that jumped out at us is we had one kind of outlier. He, he's, he, uh, he doesn't match everything, and he's cursy. And guess where he lives? Is he a good Irish person that we were expecting for him? No, he lives in Oxford, England in 1600. Now, what's going on? We know L226 is definitely Irish. So we suspected that he may have, you know, moved to England, and because you know English people 
don't like Irish people that much back in the 1600s. He probably changed his name to Kersey, you know, to uh, avoid uh, the, the prejudice at the time. Uh, L21 is about 40% of uh, the United Kingdom and, and Ireland. And I don't like to use the term British Isles, but that's been sticking along for a long time. Uh, around 50% uh, are signed to uh, newer SNPs. And what you can do with uh, SDRs is you can, you can actually develop these patterns. And I have a tool called the L21 Predictor. And it will take 50% of the 15,000 people and immediately tell you if you belong to L226 or L222 or L193. You'll just go directly to it and says you got 90% odds. And this is all based on uh, statistics. Uh, it's called binary logic, uh, you know, binary logistic regression. It fits perfectly for uh, genealogy and genetics. It's a perfect match. Uh, and in the time frame of a, of a SNP that's a, a thousand to two thousand years old, it works beautifully. Now, when you get down to recent times, there's a lot more parameters involved. Here's how you know. Here's how it works. Uh, there's a 11 marker signature for M222. Everybody who has tested a six and above, and that's about 500 people, have tested positive. Everybody that tested a five and below, all 15,000 have tested negative. It's a, what's called a perfect curve. Now, one time we had a guy up here test negative. And this guy was upset because he thought for sure he belonged to the Eagles. And, uh, and so he actually went and tested the competitor. And he came back up to two. And they readdressed it. And boom, they corrected him. And he come back to a perfect curve again. <laughs> but actually, statistics like that better that error because from a math, it makes a nice, beautiful S-curve with one error. And uh, you know, math doesn't like things that are so simple because if it's that simple, why are you using math? And so all the uh, algorithms uh, don't really work as well. And so uh, thanks to Dennis O'Brien, I mean, and Dennis Wright, we got L226 on a tree, but we, we had for a long time, is this it? You know, we're going to have a SNP that has, you know, 300 surnames in it. Uh, and then in the last year or so, we've done 50 NGS tests, 50 SNP pack tests, and probably about 100 individual SNP tests. And now we, we were just, you know, really happy. It's, it's happening. We're, we're able to actually sign people. Like, uh, there's, there's several O'Brien lines. I mean, I mean, we thought they're all one. And sometimes they had genetic distance of two and three, but they belong to a different group over a thousand years ago. And, and the Casey's now, we, I discovered a third branch of Casey's under this, this, this guy. And that, that uh, SNP branch didn't even exist uh, five months ago. So the nice thing is you, you, there's the Senate charts that are going to be, can be generated now. You can't generate for everybody because uh, it's still a signature-based type thing to make these charts. And not everybody has tested for every signature yet. And so you, it, it's only like uh, 50 to 75 percent complete. But now we're ready to chart about 50 to 75 percent of, of L226. Uh, when we use the earlier SDR only type things, you know, we didn't know if that's accurate or not. It looked like good math and it put people together. Well, then when we started doing SNP testing in the early stage, we found out, man, STRs by themselves just do not work. I mean, it was, it was like over a 90% error rate. And so everybody gave up on, you know, building trees based on, you know, mathematics and stuff. But now that we have a whole bunch of SNP branches and a whole bunch of testing of those SNP branches, both, uh, we have a lot more information. There was a real good promising tool called SAPP, uh, and it still does a really good job of collecting surname clusters. You can just run it, and it'll, it'll collect everybody that has a common uh, pattern. 
and it'll, it'll collect about 10 or 20 of them, and it's, it, it, it beats the tedious method of going through a spreadsheet. So it still has a lot of value, but it's based on the wrong kind of math. And, and the guy kind of gave up, and he was having performance problems, and, and he couldn't get above 150, and you really need, you know, 1,000, 2,000 to do MT22, and I'll do it six pretty soon as well. So with the flurry of recent SNP packs, uh, we, we have gone up to 23% of our group is tested out of 500. That, that's a pretty good penetration level. Um, and, uh, and it used to be, before the SNP packs, I was sitting at 50%. In the last two weeks, I've been busy charting away, and now it's up to almost 70% of the entire group is charted. So... Uh, and, and I'm sure, uh, since we're getting so many good results from the SNP packs for L226, I, I'm sure that more people are going to jump on the bag wagon and that number will go up more. But then you're going to have those unlucky people who, you know, in that, who don't have any genetic distance. You know, they're going to, they're going to be the last ones that are going to be hard to figure out, that last 10 or 15 percent. So we have 50 AGS tests. We're now up to 41 branches, uh, and I'm sure between the two dentists and myself, <laughs> we're probably missing three or four because we've been working here or vacationing. And, uh, and so uh, we have 75 individual tests. Uh, they have revealed seven new branches, and as well as uh, six um, SNP packs Tests, I mean, SNP pack test has revealed six more branches. So the SNP pack test, this is a really unique, and this right did an excellent job. We had 50 private SNPs inserted into our SNP pack, and so, you know, those are just random private to one individual, and now we have six new ones, that now we have three people that match. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, and 68% is like, you know, I'm, I, I didn't think we were going to get there that quick, to be honest. Now, how does charting work? Uh, as with this prediction, it's based on signatures. It's not, and, and it has a combination of signatures. But it's got several more factors. And, and this is fairly complex. And if we can get this in a tool, then you can just dial in, you know, what reliability do you, will you accept in your charting? You can, if you want to dial down to 20% or 10%, I'll chart 95% of it. Or if you want to leave it at 40%, you can get 60% of the chart. It's going to be up to the end user. Of course, there will be a lot of people that say, <laughs> give, me, give me the whole chart, you know, and it won't be very accurate. But I only include ones at 40%, because I thought 40% probability would be worthy enough. That's a 50-50 chance if you, you know, rather than to just randomly test, you get at least a 50-50 chance on this one. Uh, but something that jump, has jumped out at me is that if you have three or four markers that match, that's a really strong signature in, in, in this time frame. And there's very few three signature matches that are overlapping which is a real surprise to me. And so those are ten tending to be pretty reliable in this, you know, probably the 70 to 80% range. Once you go down to two signatures, boy, it gets ugly quick because I found some that there are like six different copies of two signature matches. And these are all the faster markers. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm just having to filter them all out. And uh, genetic distance is another one because sometimes you'll get a pretty good match, but you know everybody else has a genetic distance of two or three, and also there's another guy at eight or nine. That's just an anomaly. You know he doesn't really belong there. That's probably a small duplicate signature. Uh, and analyzing tracking 41 new branches. You know that's that's it's it takes a lot of manual time because every time you get a new test result. You have to go look at all of it, all of it, its own signature for just that one test, and then develop a branch based on that one that test results. And so you're adding little chunks of the tree at a time for each person who has tested for SNPs. Uh, 
the bright spot on this is I think this could be automated pretty easily. And I'm trying to write a functional spec. So if there's any programmers out there you know, who write, really want to make an impact, uh, this tool won't, wouldn't be that hard. I mean, to get the 90%, it wouldn't be that hard. To get that last 10% where you look at, you know, unusual marker values, that would, you know, double the, the length of it, but get you the last 5%. So benefits of charting. Uh, so you can graphically see your matches. You know, there's nothing better than having a little chart that shows your matches. It allows people to make better records. As an admin, you can now say, it looks like you belong to this branch, and you, you have a very unique signature. Maybe you should do a big Y test. Or you know, you're really close to this NGS tester. Maybe you should test some private snips of his. I mean, it, it's really going to really help us in, in, in giving advice to people with testing device. And it summarizes all the, the connections in a, a pretty easy way to understand. It's very graphic. And it's automated. A lot of administrators could use it. Um, and, and it's in a format. It's a, it's a box descendant chart. And here's the box descendant chart. Uh, if you, uh, this, these are all the branches. Now this is not a real, you know, good box chart. This is just a, a portal into all the branches. So if you branch down to, and this, this is hypertext enabled, it, it should be. This is not <laughs> done on my computer, so uh, you want to do this one? No, this one here. Okay, that, okay. So this is my South Carolina branch, and it has a pretty good uh, progression of YCRs. And I actually in, in, in put in the oldest known ancestor because I've been working on this line for 40 years. I published a book in 1980 on this line, so I'm real familiar with this one. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very uh, easy to understand. And we have a second uh, NGS test pending on this guy because he's kind of an outlier. He, he actually is interesting because, you know, we have this major branch, which you probably cannot see, I'm sure, is 460, 11, and 12. And this guy is 460, 11, 12, so he had belonged over here, right? But he had two people test, so he's not 460. So he could belong here, or he could belong here, we don't really know. It's either a parallel, uh, ind independent parallel mutation of these same marker values, or this is a backwards mutation. We don't really know. And, um, but because of that, he got really interested in did a, uh, he, he ordered a Wiley 2.1 and gave him an opportunity. So, uh, and as I showed earlier, this group is. We're really lucky because this, this is an SDR base that's going to 12 to 13 is a very nice branch that splits up. We know all these cases are closely related, and we know all these cases are not as closely related. And I knew, my gut feeling, I knew that this guy was related to me before he lived. I knew this guy was really close to me. But I thought this guy was close related because he lived in the same area, but he's not. And I have this new guy who just tested recently, and I got to go see where he's from and research. And I'm now actually interested in going looking at him and seeing where he fits in. And then we have our Hanby, and the really interesting thing is all these people are from South Carolina, except for this guy. He's a Meredith. He matches us. He's from Virginia. Okay, so oops. And, and all these cases are supposed to be from Virginia, but all the people that are supposed to match from Virginia. Guess what? You know, seven tested and seven are not matched. So I guess the old family histories were not correct on that. What are the um, colors here? The colors, uh, the color coding, if they're blue, they're actually tested. Uh, it, and then they're, if they're purple, that's a, uh, a, a SNP based branch, which can have some SDRs. If they're white box, that's an SDR branch. And then the other colors, anywhere from being very green to more red, the more green you are, the higher probability. This is a 70%, and this is a 40%. I'll do one more. How are we doing here? Yep. 
Okay. And my other favorite one, which is another Casey. You've seen Bill Bryan in the rights a lot, so. Uh, and so here's a, and this one is very different looking. This one is much more, first of all, it's a lot more reddish, <laughs> except for this one green. So these people need to test it, kind of verify. This is probably in the 50 to 60 percent range, 50 50 type. But, you know, 60 percent of these people are Casey's, which is a pretty good marker. And this is, DC 69 is very unique because it's the only branch off of our oldest branch before we go down to everybody else. So uh, it's, it's a, and uh, this, this tracks uh, the uh, clan. Uh, lore that they're a very early uh, branch off the O'Briens, or I'm not sure if they're kin to the O'Briens, they were just confederated with the O'Briens, and there was, they were an ally of, of, of their, that group. I'll do one more. Or? Sure. Okay. And this one is, I like this one because it's just, um, it shows you the power of, uh, of NGS testing. Before we had uh, this A60697, and it was a, a pretty good mishmash, but there were some you know, candies over here and some cans over here. And then they did another NGS test, got DC19. Now there's two cannons, three cannons, a buck cannon, and even over here you got a cannon and a cannon. So we're now beginning to realize that the cannon surname probably happened here or in between here. And um, McCann is probably a, 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 a survey variation of, of Cannon or vice versa. But that's a good, strong uh, signal. DC-19 means you're this, this Cannon group. And over here, you have, you have, you have candy, Kennedys and O'Neills, which are quite different, and Tui, uh, which is quite different. So this is a really nice genealogical, you know, this, this that means you are a Cannon, uh, and a particular Cannon. Line. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting, Robert, and um, cutting edge. This is uh, very, very interesting to see because I think a lot of us in the audience who are uh, surname project administrators were, were going down the same path. Um, I think some of us have discovered it independently, so we're kind of all converging. Oh yeah, I'm independent on that. <laughs> well, you've been doing it probably for a lot longer than most people. Yeah. Um, so this is very interesting because I've, I've done this with my Gleason project as well. I know James Irvine is doing it with his um, Irvine project, and a few other people in the audience are doing uh, a similar type of exercises. I think it's interesting the way that you're color coding the probability of uh, your predictions based on the SNPs and the STRs, which is not something that I've done before. Um, one of the things that uh, I think will be very interesting in the future is when we do get it automated, will be to have also the dates for the branching points. And that can be very difficult to estimate because it, it's usually a very large range. It could only be anywhere from 500 AD to 1500 AD. But then also putting in, as well as the surnames, the locations of the actual uh, most distant common ancestor, most distant known ancestor for each of the participants in the projects. Yeah, and I just didn't have time to actually add the counties and we're, you know, and, and they're all in Munster, okay, so they're all in three, count, three or four counties, except some are, you know, hot, uh, further up, but, you know, that'd be nice to see that exactly if there's some kind of geographic clustering as well as survey clustering. Have you been able to get down to the townland level? No, we're, the, the bulk of our uh, L226, and Dennis, correct me if I'm wrong, is we have about 70% in the four counties. And then the rest of them, yeah, the Sarah Limerick, Tipperary, and, and uh, Cary, Cary? Cork, 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 and Cary. Mm -hmm. uh, those, those are probably, you know, three quarters of everybody, and then the rest of them are just spread out over Ireland. And we have a few outliers in Germany and that kind of stuff. But, we, I found matches of L226 and Lithuania. So from Munster to Munster. 
<laughs> so we have time for a few questions. We'll get, uh, take one from Mike O'Connell over here. Mike, I'm going to ask you to move out to this chair here because you're very close to that speaker and I'm just scared oh, that oh, yes, it might yes, uh, uh, create problems. Uh, just a, a question you mentioned about counties and so on, you know. And um, Morris mentioned Tomlins because Tomlins will tell you, you know, in Clare, right, between Innocent Eppet, between Innocent Kirush, there's a Townland for uh, Mary, or a parish called Lissy Casey, which means that the fort of the Caseys. Mm. This is Fort Mary. And also, for the east near the town of Shannon, uh, there's a, you pass through now the motorway, Cuts Road, it's a place called Valley Casey, which is the, the town of the Townland of Caseys. You know, so the Casey comes up an awful lot in the end. It's something to look at because when the trust are settled, eventually it became part of the name of the area and so on. Well, unfortunately for my particular Casey brands, we have no connections to Ireland at all, even though we know we're Irish. They're just, nobody's tested from there. And we have no 20, cases. they're all South Carolina or one Virginia. Wow. But, and there's some things in the audience. We have a Casey, we have a Casey, okay. Yeah. We, have to, we have to get some uh, male relatives. Well, if, you, if, you, if you give me one of those free DNA tests, then you can prove your ancestry, I'll give it to you. Oh, well, you are getting free DNA tests, yeah. so um, do you want to give your free DNA tests away to a male Casey? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, some, it doesn't have to be a male. It has to be somebody who has a good pedigree chart of their Casey's. A little good pedigree chart of the Casey's? Uh, at least three or four generations back. Great grandmother. Did you have do you have the uh, father though? Uh, yes, I think so. Well, we obviously had a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have that memorized. <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. <laughs> it's a start. And who's the other Casey? There are two Casey's over here. Yeah, great grandmother. I don't have her father. Okay, I need to have a father because I can't tie it into Y D N A without a father. Uh, I know somebody that might be able to a male Casey that um, he thinks. We may be um, related. Um, I think the Farrells were the major clan in Longford. Uh, I'm Farrells. <laughs> but um, I've heard that they, there was kind of, uh, maybe, I don't really know, the Farrells came from 1014, from the Battle from Tark, I think it's where the men derived. But the Casey's, I think, were in Longford before that time, and there are a lot of Casey's in particular areas of Longford. And I saw it was Scammon on your chart, but there was no sign of Longford. I imagine nobody's been tested because they do, I'd say down there there's a big uptake. Uh, we, we don't have a single person from Ireland of a Casey that's been tested. Uh, they're all Americans who have tied back to, to, to Ireland. Not a single person from Ireland has been Casey. Question, John. You, you spoke about the modal. STRs for L21. Right. Is, is that something that's sort of agreed across the community? And are there similar models for other? Yes, they're all the big ones Where like do I find you, them? Uh, just go contact the admin administrator for U106, L21. Go to see Mike Walsh's spreadsheet. There, there's one controversial one on 449, is it a 29 or a 30? But it it, it's so fast that it doesn't make much difference. But uh, it, it, it's, you know, he has, he and I have about 20,000 people at 67 markers. It's pretty easy to figure out the most common value. Would there be one for L2? I, the L2 is a pretty small branch. It, it, you probably wouldn't have enough sample size to get a good marker. But U106, DF27. All those big ones have very well established uh, models. Yeah, Rich Rock has uh, 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 a and Gail Matheson has a web page which keeps track of all the modal applicants for <coughs> R1B. We could do with actually putting those in the wiki if someone can come up with a list and we can publish them in the wiki. That would be really, really helpful because I don't think Diana maintains her page anymore. Uh, they're all, I mean, I've if you go to the Happel Group projects, they're all advertised there as well. So, but they're not consolidated. That's a problem. I just can I just ask a quick question? Have you many 
talked about how 400 STRs is going, if that's going to make any difference to this problem? Yes, yeah, I, I so think. Has anyone actually studied um, STRs? Is uh, that going to get rid of this problem? Of, um, I can't remember. Is it Ian McDonnell who's collecting them? And yeah. What? You want a six? Uh, yeah, I think he's collecting all the STRs and trying to analyze which ones we need to filter out, like the CDYs, you know, they're too fast. Uh, and also he's trying to figure out how do we put them on a database, which, you know, volunteer for that, yeah, I want to run a database. <laughs> and another thing would be really nice would be an, an upgrade of Leo Little's uh, tool that looks at the, the, uh, the frequency distribution of SDR marker values haplogroup by haplogroup. He's only done six of the major haplogroups, O and B, O and A. Um, I think he's got I1, I in there as well. But it would be nice to, because I use that a lot for identifying rare market values in my R1B <laughs> members. Uh, but, but we need something a little bit more extensive than that, I think. Right. And of course, Family Tree DNA has all the data. So it's just a question of somebody analyzing it. Um, I do know that there's at least two people that are thinking of animating and automating, uh, automating, I should say, everything that we've seen here today. Right. And I think that in the next 12 months or so, we might get the first tool that actually automates the combination of SNPs, STORs, and surnames. And I think uh, the take home message for the audience today is that come back in about a year's time, and you'll actually be able to see these automatically generated charts for your particular a branch of the human evolutionary tree. So there are exciting times ahead. And Robert, uh, thank you so much for whetting our appetite. We hope you come back, back and tell us more in due course. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's the